All right, so my name is Rachel Sanders. I'm the volunteer program coordinator here at East Cyber Mission. And we have a great chat for you guys tonight with all of our STEM professionals. I'd like to go ahead and let Catherine and Carrie introduce yourselves real quick. Sure, I'm Catherine Lasky, the assistant director of a at NSD. And I'm Carrie, I'm the STEM education coordinator for East Cyber Mission. Christine, if you'd like to introduce yourself, and then Faith. Sure. Yes, hi, I'm Christine, and I am the eCyber Mission Program Coordinator, or sorry, Program Manager. Hi, I'm Faith. I'm the eCyber Mission Senior Communications and Marketing Specialist. All right, awesome. So we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to share a PowerPoint, and then you will meet our cyber guides. All right, so everyone here tonight is a STEM professional in their field. They're scientists, engineers, researchers, development specialists, and we are going to go ahead and get started. So our first cyber guide is Zachary Stitcher, and he's a developmental scientist at Emory University. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Zach if you'd like to start with just your title and where you work and what you do and what you're currently working on. Uh, my name is Zachary Stitcher. Um, I work at Emory University, but more specifically, the Emory Institute for Drug Development. We're in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, we are essentially a biotech company that operates within Emory University, and we focus on developing new drugs for antiviral um, drug development. And typically, we're targeting uh, um, markets like influenza, but we're also looking to uh, to go after viruses that are maybe less well known. Um, so currently, we have a couple of of drugs that are in the market. One of them is a COVID antiviral, and we're currently working on developing drugs for the next pandemic. So we look to see what viruses could potentially cause pandemics, and that's what we're targeting right now. Um, awesome. So you're saving lives out there. We appreciate you. <laughs> That's right. Um, so if you don't mind just sharing kind of like who your inspiration in STEM or what it was, or even as a child, like what got you into the field? Uh, I mean, starting from a young age, Bill Nye, the science guy was a big <laughs> influence. Um, but truly it's the, the teachers that I had in starting in middle school to high school were just incredible um, mentors for me. And then moving into my undergraduate studies, I just had a fantastic group of mentors around me that um, really instilled the confidence that I needed to be successful in the field and um, helped me learn everything that I, I needed to know. I loved Bill Nye the Science Guy. I remember when they used to wheel the TV in there with the VHS in class yep. and everyone cheered. I'm sure none of our students remember VHSs or DVDs, but I hope you guys <laughs> That's have seen okay. Bill. I hope you guys have seen Bill Nye the Science Guy. So, do you have any tips for students who are interested in like pursuing a career in STEM? Yeah, so I would suggest that you just diversify the experiences that you get. Um, so try and find as many ways to to find the field in STEM that is most interesting to you because. If, if you are um, someone who is STEM minded, uh, there's a lot of different options for you that you're going to be able to have success in. It's really just finding the particular path that you're interested in. And the only way to do that is to give yourself different experiences. Um, so find an inter internship, uh, look at different research groups and see what they're doing and just try and find ways to, to get into a place where you're doing what you're interested in doing. That's great advice. And then finally, I know that you have not judged mission folders yet. So if you have any experience in kind of, you know, either observing coworkers work or projects, but do you have any advice or what stands out for you for a mission folder or project? What makes it memorable? So someone that has found a way to isolate a single variable um, so if you're going to, to run an experiment or perform a study, 
designing that study so that you're actually going to be able to learn what you're trying to learn um, from that study. And it, it's difficult work, but if you can really drill down into what you're trying to understand, you can design a study so that you're actually finding out what you're hoping to find out. Thanks, Zach. That was great insight for our students, and I really appreciate you getting on tonight. Yep, you're welcome. All right, so we are going to move on to our next cyber guide. All right, Hema, if you would like to introduce yourself, what your title is, and what you're currently working on. Hi, good evening. So first to start off, my, my name is Hema Manamanan. I currently work as a general engineer, um, not for the Department of the Army anymore. I used to work for Army headquarters, and I just recently started a new position um, at the Defense Standardization Program Office, so still within the DOD. Um, and I'm just kind of getting my feet wet in this new position, but um, what projects I'm generally going to be working on are related to defense standardization as a whole, which sounds like a really big term, but in reality, it's taking best practices and, and guidance that's kind of dispersed in various agencies within the military services and, and taking that goodness and, and bringing it together into a cohesive policy or guidance document that the broader community can then utilize as a whole. So really, we're trying to make things easier so people are not reinventing the wheel over and over again. If something works, we want to take it, market it, and then explore um, kind of worldwide. Um, so that's something I'm really excited about. A lot of my projects will be focused in systems engineering and systems engineering modernization, um, particularly looking at digitally transforming kind of our standard processes and practices to be more fit for the 21st century. So it's something I'm very excited about and um, definitely looking forward to, to get more involved as, as the weeks go on. I really appreciate you breaking that down because those are big terms, but you make yes. it really like bite-sized <laughs> and understandable. So I appreciate that. How did, how did you get into this field? Like what inspired you to do this? So my journey is, is kind of all over the place. And just, we'll just preface that there. I actually um, started out loving STEM from my classes in middle school, high school, and really starting to, to have a passion for chemistry and mathematics. And so I pursued an education in chemical engineering because that was a really good blend for my interests at the time. Um, I started full time in the chemical engineering field, working on materials research, and it was great. And I really enjoyed it. But then I performed a rotational assignment within in a program office environment and I was doing more systems engineering work. And that was something that just clicked for me. It's something I hadn't had the exposure for in the past. But once I, I started diving in, it's not something that I wanted to get out of. So from that moment, I knew that, you know, any potential career opportunities uh, that I wanted to pursue after the fact would be involved in systems engineering. So that's really how I have sort of carved out that interest uh, over time. And so far, we're still in the same industry. But I mean, the great thing about STEM is that you have the flexibility to work on a lot of interdisciplinary work. And so you can work in one space in one area for five years and really branch off from that if you so desire. And so there's no need to, to feel like it's niche. There's definitely opportunities to explore everywhere you look. I love that you kind of talked about how you thought you wanted to do one thing, but then you mm -hmm. tried out another thing and you're like, oh, I like this. And yes. I really like, I would encourage students to explore those other avenues like you discussed. So you, you kind of answered this question, but like, do you have any additional tips on like students who are interested in like getting involved in STEM or pursuing a career in STEM? Yeah, kind of like what I was talking about before is really just diving into any opportunity. I think Zach sort of hit on this as well. It's really just 
you know, seeing what's out there, maybe within your own community, maybe you branch out to other communities, states, whatever, what have you, and, and really exploring what's out there, because you never know what you're going to like until you actually try it. So my philosophy is always like, you can't miss the shots that you don't take. And I may be getting that idiom wrong. But I it's like, if you have an interest, or you have a desire, even if it's temporary, just go for it, try it out. Um, you may like it. That's kind of what happened with me in my career. And I made a severe 180. <laughs> so I, it, it's not an issue because, you know, STEM is so broad. There's so many opportunities out there that you really can find something that, that really works with you. Yeah. I think how broad STEM is, is just going to show tonight how we have so many STEM professionals doing different things. So um, I wanted to touch on, I know you have, I don't believe you've judged mission folders yet, but you know, kind of what the idea is and what the core of that is, what would make a mission folder memorable to you as like a virtual judge? What I really look for is creativity and that like passion. Uh, you can tell a lot from even just reading like a, a like an abstract or a, like a scientific paper, you can really get it or like watching a presentation, you really get a sense for how much passion the individual has in the work that they're presenting. And to me, that passion and that creativity, that spark that they have is very contagious. And so I get excited to see other people that are really excited about their work and, and I hope vice versa as well. So to me, it's like if, if someone is showing that genuine passion that they found a topic that's really interested them and they've really dived deep and they think that, you know, what they've found or produced is going to have like really good meaning and um, be meaningful for the community. Like that's already a winner for me. <laughs> Thank you, Hema. I really appreciate all of your insight. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you for being here tonight. All right. So we are going to move on to our next cyber guide. All right, Dr. Garrett, if you would let this, this picture is just the coolest. I hope everyone agrees. Um, but if you would just go ahead and tell us where you work and kind of what you're working on right now. Hello, everyone. Um, Gregory Garrett. I'm a research physicist at the uh, Army Research Lab, which is located in Maryland. And as you can see in the picture, uh, I work with I work with lasers to study different materials different sort of crystals and semiconductors. And what my team is working on now is we are trying to, to study different materials that, give, that might give us ultraviolet laser pointers. If you think about the laser pointers, the red laser pointers that you have maybe in your classroom or that you've seen around, the reason that the laser pointer is red is the type of material, the type of semiconductor that is in that laser and we're studying new materials that could give us ultraviolet light. So we could have little ultraviolet laser pointers. Awesome. I know it's so exciting just to kind of like look at this and hear about what you do. So, so who and what has been an inspiration in STEM for you? Is it anything as a kid or do you have it now? Well, I was thinking about this and, and two things I can remember when I was growing up was that uh, they, uh, they built a, a nuclear power plant kind of near where I was living. And that piqued my interest. I want to understand what, what's going on in there. What is this place? What are what are these atoms and stuff? And how does that work? And so I remember being really interested at that time about what atoms are and electrons and all the different sort of nuclear, what we call nuclear physics sort of stuff right now. Um, I also remember that the uh, space shuttle program in NASA back when I was younger and all the started and all the cool things that, that went on in space. And I thought, oh, that'd be, that'd be really interesting to be an astronaut and do all this science in space. I mean, I try to understand what, what they're doing up there and why that's important. Yeah, that's so cool. I love that you ended up being next to a nuclear power point. I've never heard of someone being right next to that. It's cool. So what well, tips? Not right next. <laughs> you live, I, I imagine you look they're, at They're your very big, so they're easy to see from far away. <laughs> um, so what tips do you have for students who are just trying to break into STEM or want to pursue a career in them? Well, I think for the, the, for the students we have in, in this 
I mean, the fact that you're participating in these sort of programs is, is very good for showing your interest. You can learn your light right now. You're learning about all the different things in STEM. And as the other people are upset are going to say, there, there is a lot of different fields in STEM. Don't feel that you have to decide what you're going to be when you grow up right now. Take this opportunity to explore all the different things. Um, I remember during the summer, besides going to soccer camp, there was also very interesting science camps where I could learn about astronomy or I could learn about computer. I remember computer pro learning to do computer programming. I thought that was very interesting. And then there was one on biology. I didn't really like the biology one, so I'm not a biologist now, but you know, I tried it out to see what was going on. Thanks. I, I, like, I like that you were doing soccer camp and learning at the same time. It's very diverse of you. Um, so I know that you're a seasoned virtual judge. So tell us what you look for in the mission folder. Um, so uh, as others have been saying, um, and as I also, as I tell my, my team members that have to give presentations and stuff, you know, be excited when you're up there and, and giving your talk, show your interest. If if you're bored when you're writing your mission folder, you're gonna create a very boring mission folder and the people that read it are gonna be very bored with your mission folder. So if you're excited about what you're doing and you describe everything you're doing and you bring across everything that you're doing, then that will translate onto the judges and they will also feel the emotions that you're putting into this. And another thing that's very important for this sort of format where everything's online, um, we only see what you put in the mission folder. So maybe you did a lot of work, but we're not gonna know that unless you tell us in the mission folder, write it out, all the things you did, show us the things you did with your, with like maybe taking pictures or people even do movies sometimes, making presentations that we can go through and look at. It's very important that you understand that we we only know what you put in your mission folder. So put as much stuff in there as you can. Thank you. And I hope you guys heed that advice because Dr. Garrett is a judge. So that's great advice. Thank you, Dr. Garrett. All right. So we are going to move on to Anne. And I just absolutely am tickled that you have the Pentagon dog photos. So if you could just... <laughs> Touch on that, and then if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and tell us where you work and what you're currently doing. Yes, absolutely. Um, I am Ann Kulashevitz. I am a research chemist at the DevCom um, Chemical Biological Center. So I am neighbors with Dr. Garrett, because um, I'm also in Maryland, in the Edgewood side. Um, so my two handsome companions here, um, on the left is Franklin, who is my current service dog. And on the right is Nala, who is my retired service dog. Um, she retired two years ago. She's an incredible health, but she decided she did not want to work anymore. Um, so she lives with me and she enjoys retirement. Um, so of course they had to have their headshots done too at work. So they have their professional photos as well. Um, Right now, I work in the CVR filtration branch, um, making novel materials um, for filter applications and also protective garments. Most of my materials that I work with are metal organic frameworks or MOPs. Um, I also work a lot with uh, photocatalysis experiments with MOPs um, using light and MOP to degrade uh, chemical agents. Thank you, I, that is uh, quite interesting. I've never heard of half of the words you've said, so. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and research that after too. <laughs> so um, who or what has been an inspiration to you in the STEM field as a child, as an adult, either one? Um, well, currently, I think my biggest inspiration are the students that I see, the next generation of uh, STEM students coming through. I love being able to mentor interns that come through the lab. It's one of my favorite parts. Summer is I think my favorite time of the year in the lab, because um, we always have summer students come through. Um, I I love the fresh ideas that they bring to the lab and it always inspires me and, and kind of changes my viewpoint of my work. So I would say that definitely the next generation of STEM students um, is my inspiration currently. Yeah, I get super inspired when I hear these students talk about what they wanna do and how they're gonna save the planet and change lives. So I, I agree with you. So speaking on that, as students is your biggest inspiration, what tips would you um, advise them about getting into the STEM field? 
I would say definitely take any opportunity that's available to you, even if it's something small. Um, obviously, being involved in this program is, is great. Um, but any opportunity um, is useful and things that may not even be directly related to the STEM field that you're interested in. Um, it's always worth taking that opportunity. Um, I had a summer internship where I did nothing but coding for an entire summer and wondered when am I ever going to use this as a chemist. Um, but our NMR instruments, when I came to work at um, CDC, they use Unix. And so I already knew the Unix commands um, to be able to run the program. And so it was very useful. Um, so you never really know how, you know, different STEM fields are going to dovetail. So even if it may not necessarily be your particular area of focus, embrace any opportunity that you have in the STEM fields. I like that. I was always in algebra class. I'm like, when am I going to use this? And so <laughs> there you see, you never know. So if you um, could talk a little bit about what would make a mission folder memorable to you, what you look for, something that would make it successful. I think the biggest thing for me um, is seeing how the challenges were overcome. Um, I think the, the real key to being a successful scientist is not necessarily um, getting the right answer right away, but being able to navigate and pivot and embrace the obstacles along the way, because science is not necessarily a straight line. A lot of times there's a very circuitous route. Um, and so I think for me, being able to see a budding scientist be able to navigate that and overcome those challenges and find meaningful data out of it, I think is, is important to me. Awesome. Thank you. That's, that's actually great. And I really appreciate that. So thank you for being here tonight. Of course. Thank you for having me. Yes, ma'am. All right. So we are going to go ahead and move on to Ryan Morse. If you would like to go ahead and introduce yourself and what you're currently doing and what you're currently studying. I know you're in a uh, medical student at Virginia Tech. So if you'd like to just kind of expand on that. Yeah, sure. So like you said, my name is Ryan. I'm a, a third year medical student at Virginia Tech. Uh, I'm currently in the clinic most of the time. They kind of bounce us around so where we go to all sorts of different departments, but I'm currently working in uh, radiology. Uh, but in addition to being in the classroom or in the hospital, we also have to do research uh, pretty much full time as well. So uh, I'm very often in the lab late in the evening on weekends every once in a while. Um, they have us do a number of projects, but the big one that's really mine is um, I'm working on using ultrasound uh, to to kill bacteria, basically. So we can use this to to basically kill bacteria that are in places in the body that antibiotics can't really reach. Uh, so it's very interesting and cool work. Yeah. I love how innovative that is. I didn't even know that was really a thing. I wouldn't have ever thought of that. So it's cool that you're doing research and learning that technology. Oh, yes. Yeah. So if you would go ahead and just kind of talk about what would be an ins what was an inspiration to you, what is an inspiration to you in STEM? Ooh, so this is a hard one to answer. For me, I, I think I'll talk about the most inspirational person I've ever seen in uh, STEM. So I actually, when I was about to become a medical student, I read a book on um, a doctor. His name is Michael DeBakey. And this guy, he started practicing medicine in the early 20s, if I remember right. And this was back before they had, you know, antibiotics, anything. And he was one of the hardest working people out there. One of the, He would work frequently 80, 100 hour weeks, which is ridiculous, but he did it and he worked a very, very long career. And over this career, he wound up basically inventing the field of cardiac surgery and uh, heart transplants as well. And he continued working for pretty much his whole life. And he was just an incredible guy and really showed what you can do if you if you really fully commit yourself to uh, to a cause. Well, I certainly hope he took a vacation after he retired. So good for, I'm good not, for I'm him. I'm not going to go that hard, but he was couldn't a very... be me. Yeah, couldn't be me. <laughs> um, so, what tips do you have for students who are breaking into the STEM field, or maybe even want to pursue a career in the medical field? Yeah, so I think I'm going to kind of go off of what a lot of people are saying here, which is keep your options open. Um, and particularly, I knew a lot of people, myself included who tended to uh, kind of shoehorn themselves into one particular field. So like, for instance, when I was a kid, I was like, I'm going to be an engineer. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to design rocket ships for NASA. It's going to be great. That's what I told myself. That's what I told everybody. Went to college for aerospace engineering. 
And it wasn't until really the end of my undergraduate, my junior year, when I was like, all right, I think I like medicine more than I like engineering. And at that point, I had to kind of pivot and change my life, basically. But the point being, keep your options open and don't just tell yourself from a young age that like, I'm going to do this thing and I can't see myself doing anything else. I, li I like that everyone's advice is like you said, hitting on the same thing, diversify, diversify, diversify and explore. So thank you for like, just kind of hitting that home. So um, the last question I have for you is what would make a mission folder memorable to you or successful? So to me, whenever I'm looking at starting on a project, whether it be just research or some sort of problem solving in the medical field, the big thing for me is keep it simple. I love, love, love a simple, elegant solution over something that's very complicated, has all the bells and whistles, razzle-dazzle, but you don't understand very well. So I, I would strongly recommend you find something that you, it's not, doesn't have to be overcomplicated, but something that you and your team know very well and can explain well, as opposed to something that sounds very complicated and very impressive that you may not know quite as well. That's great advice. You don't have to necessarily reinvent the wheel. So Exactly. All right. Well, thank you for being here tonight, Ryan. We really appreciate hearing all of your uh, insight. So certainly, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So we are going to move along. All right. Dr. Lasco is actually not able to join us tonight, so we are going to move along and go to Dr. Tobias. So if you would just go ahead and tell us kind of what you're working on right now, what you do, and a little bit about that. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Alex Tobias. I work at um, a place called MITRE, and it's a very interesting kind of place where uh, we primarily advise um, all the departments of our federal government in STEM topics. So MITRE has 10,000 people and um, all kinds of STEM professionals, everything, physics, lots of computer and software engineers, uh, not so many chemists actually, but um, a good amount of biologists and people who studied life sciences. So I'm actually a chemical engineer from my education, but I think of myself more as a, a biological scientist or a biological engineer. And so in my job, I, I work on a few things. The main thing I work on is actually kind of a software and a network that we're making to make it easier for people to collaborate on biological engineering projects. So what I mean, the, the type of projects where you want to um, say take a yeast and change what it does. So maybe right, you know, right now we get ethanol from yeast, um, but maybe we want the, the yeast to make a, a different uh, fuel molecule or maybe uh, a, a drug that's only available from the bark of some tree in the Amazon that's very expensive to get and very rare. So um, that, that kind of stuff, um, we don't do that much of it in the lab at MITRE, but we, we work on um, projects that um, to help, help other departments of the government who are interested in that. Uh, we write reports on that stuff. And as I mentioned, we, we develop software that uh, the government and sometimes more than the government can use. Um, so we're a public interest nonprofit. So we're not doing things to make money. Luckily we can do things um, and, and sort of give, give them as gifts to the world. I love that you said that because, you know, the core part of eCyber Mission is doing something to help the community. And it's kind of what you've dedicated your life to. So it's really cool. So I know that I've heard that you've always been interested in STEM. I heard that in some previous chats, but what kind of got you into that? What inspired you? How'd you fall into this? So, yeah, I... I have a, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I was a very competitive kind of student. And so I, I really like, I really like um, the math and science classes because those were, those were classes where there was, you know, a correct answer and, and you could kind of, it was, it was a very, it was very measurable, right? It was, it was, I mean, of course you got grades in your other classes too, but um, I liked like the, how clean it was that, you know, it's just, you're, you're, if you can get the right answer, it doesn't really matter if the teacher liked you um, or if they liked the way you wrote or the way you, the art that you did. Uh, it was like, you get, you get the right answer and, and you can get a good grade. And 
Uh, and that's that's frankly what sort of got me, you know, what sort of kept me passionate about things up until a certain point, maybe maybe even through college doing chemical engineering. But then um, I got to tell all, all the, the students on the call today that it's not the, the world of work or the world of science is not really like that. And so it's much less cut and dry, much less clear, much less about sort of getting getting the right answer or picking, especially picking the right multiple choice, to, uh, you know, choice on there. It, it's not, it's not that way. And so, um, so if, if that's your motivation, um, as a youngster, I think that that's fine, but, you know, just, just be, I think it's important to sort of try to fall in love with other aspects of, of the STEM field, um, that, that you're, you're going to pursue. So I really like what, you know, Zachary said about, trying lots of different things to find what you're passionate about because that's really that's really the key for any kind of career you're going to pick you've got to you've got to be into it you've got to you've, you've got to want to think about it you know when you get home and, and you know maybe even in your dreams and stuff because if you're not excited about it you know somebody else is going to be excited about it it's going to be very hard to be competitive with with people who who actually love it if you're just doing it for the paycheck for example so it's a bit of a long-winded answer but, no um, i i love it you also kind of incorporated my next question is that those tips to students who are getting into the stem field and i i totally relate about being a competitive student growing up you know i was always trying to do more pull-ups than the boys i wasn't necessarily beating them in math in math equations but i was i i like the passion component of what you said too and if you're doing something just for a paycheck it's really not going to be I, in my opinion, your best work, unless you're passionate about it. So the, yeah, so the other side of it is like, if you're a student, if any, if any of the students on the call today, if you, if you're, you know, in school and, and you're not getting the highest scores, let's say in your class in STEM, but you really like it, I would say, don't get discouraged and, and decide that STEM is not for you because, you know, maybe you're not the top scoring one in, in your math class or your science class because if you really like it that's actually more important i would say than than you know doing well on the kinds of tests and the kinds of assignments you get in in middle school um so the real world like i said isn't like that and so if you're if you're excited i would say don't give up um that's not what it's really like keep pursuing your interests keep trying things like e-cyber mission like other um summer camps or there's so much available now, YouTube videos, um, other competitions, reading books, uh, finding a, a mentor in your community that you can uh, talk to or maybe even get a summer job uh, at their uh, facility. Um, so, yeah, it's not just about um, getting, you know, getting the right answer from a math equation or, or picking the right choice on a multiple choice. Thanks. I really appreciate that. So what you're telling me is I could have, I could have been a rocket scientist if I just kept trying and then applied myself. If you were, yeah, if you were into it, you <laughs> could have found yourself a career some, that fits somewhere in the rocket science. Field. I love it. I love it. Um, so I know that you are a seasoned virtual judge as well. So could you tell me what you look for in a mission folder for a high score to really make it stand out? Sure. Right. So the, right, the first thing um, the first thing that you've got to do in folders is pick a pick a problem or pick a topic, right? And and so I really love seeing topics that I wasn't aware of or or that yeah that they're unique or uh, or you know I really like the local aspect of e cyber mission. So if you can pick a topic um, or a problem that's like right you know in your backyard or in the if the lake near your where you live is kind of dirty or something like that, and you can actually do something maybe to make a difference in that. Um, so that, yeah. So, you know, so every year there seems to be some, a few sort of trendy problems. Sometimes they're kind of like global problems, which are super important. And that like, you know, plastic in the ocean is probably still pretty popular. And a couple of years ago, maybe if I judge 25 folders, maybe a third of them were about, making a device to clean up plastic in the ocean and, and that's okay but you know right it's, it's not so unique right so when i say oh well here's another one about plastic in the ocean and, and maybe even the ideas of, of how to solve it are kind of the same you know we're judges we're humans so it's just not going to be as exciting versus some other really cool folders i've seen like you know somebody's baby 
baby brother was always climbing out of their crib and they wanted to make an alarm that would sound, um, you know, if they tried to climb out of the cribs to notify, you know, their parents, like a real, or someone, the lake near their house was kind of dirty and they, they figured out a way to test some filter devices um, and have people who were like canoeing on the lake drag filter devices behind and, um, and then, you know, clean up the lake that, that's right where they live. Yeah, that, I mean, that sounds awesome. And I agree, just kind of hearing about community problems I didn't exist instead of like those global issues that everyone's aware of is like really enlightening and inspiring. So, well, I really appreciate it. I want to say, Greg, I, yeah. I want to echo what Gregory said around, uh, right, think of, try to think of it, how it looks to the judge, right? We're judges. All we see is what you can put in, in your folder. And so if it's just a bunch of text with you answering those questions uh, that are given, that's okay, but we really love those attachments that you can give, attached photos. We want to see figures, pictures, data, graphs of your data. Uh, put a YouTube link with a video of your team. So I see that, right? Some some of them, maybe 10% of them do that. We love, the judges love to see like more of a picture as if we were going up to your poster in a science fair. Try to, try to make the experience for the judge more like it's in person um, with lots of exciting visual things we can really understand what you did and, and show us how much work you put in. I like that. Have the razzle dazzle factor is important, especially when you're judging all those um, folders. But yeah, thank you so much for being here tonight and sharing all of your wisdom with our students. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, so we are going to go ahead and move on, and I would like to introduce Alexis. Alexis is a graduate research assistant at Iowa State University, and if you could go ahead and kind of just tell me what you're working on right now and how that, um, what you're doing. Yeah, for sure. So I, I'm Alexis Marsh, and um, like Rachel said, I'm a graduate research assistant at Iowa State University, and specifically um, my program, the program I'm in is uh, bioinformatics and computational biology. And specifically, I work in a, a software engineering lab. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm trying to interface the, the two disciplines, computational biology and um, software engineering. And the reason we're doing this is we're, we get a lot of predictions um, from computational science. It's really important and to kind of moving a lot of fields forward. But what kind of happens is sometimes like the people that develop the software maybe aren't versed in software engineering. Maybe they were a biologist and they taught themselves how to code, which is fabulous. We love that. But they might be missing like some testing techniques or things that would make the software more robust and a little bit, maybe make the predictions a little bit accurate, more accurate, a little bit more reliable. So we want to see, can we develop testing techniques that can be applied to code? Can we make tools that um, can make the code um, different outputs. So maybe you have two code, two sets of code that are supposed to produce similar outputs, but maybe they disagree. Maybe the language they use to talk about their outputs different. Is there a way we can kind of connect those? And then kind of a third thing is um, you also have your input that you're putting into these um, tools that are making the predictions. And um, with biology, there's so many, like all of science, there's so many unknowns, and we use these things called gene annotations that try to predict like the behavior of the organism, but we might not know all the genes or the matching programs we use maybe are a little too generous, and it's saying protein A and protein B are similar, but maybe they really actually don't do the same thing, even though it seems like they should. And we want to see if we can use techniques from software engineering, because software is large and complex, biology is excuse me, large and complex. And we want to see if we can use some of those techniques to help make um, are these biological models um, more accurate as well. Again, with that idea of helping the predictions be more accurate because we want to help um, wet lab science be able to be more efficient, be able to get to answers faster so we can hopefully make a bigger impact. You know, before I had heard you previously talk about everything you do, I didn't even know that was a job. So it was super, it was super cool to learn about that. And I appreciate you being, you know, so knowledgeable in that field. So what got you into STEM? What inspired you? Yeah, so I always liked science and math. It was always my favorite. I would, you know, spend a lot of time after school working on problems and exploring it. And it just seemed like a natural fit to kind of go um, continue on. But a kind of opposite of Ryan, I actually started out thinking the biggest way, the best way I could make an impact, the way I wanted to was 
um, in medicine. Um, specifically, I wanted to be a surgeon. And then I got to college and um, to get into medical school, you should do research. And I was also taking organic chemistry class. And that was actually the first um, type of research I did was in an organic chemistry lab. And I loved understanding like how the atom or how the electrons moved and you really could get this mechanistic understanding of why reactions were happening. Um, and we were, um, so then it, that fall, I started working in um, my professor's lab and we were working on um, coming up with um, anti-cancer therapies and we were using NMR studies to try to see if we were getting reactions that would point to them being successful um, as anti-cancer therapeutics. And after he left the university, I really, really decided I liked research. I liked um, understanding how things worked, helped in making discoveries. And I wanted to, but then I also knew that th there it seemed there were steps that seemed like in, inefficient and seemed like we could do better. So when I was looking for a new lab, I found a computational chemistry lab with the goal of trying to smooth out that process and say, okay, well, we see protein A and protein B. They, and we can model it and we can say, okay, they bind together in this way. So we're looking for um, compounds that will have this type of binding affinity and um, went along that way. And then I decided that I wanted to um, stick with that and I went into the computational biology route and then ended up um, currently working with the software um, engineering, software testing end of things. Cool. Thank you. Um, so would you be able to share any tips for students who are interested in kind of breaking into the STEM field or getting involved in that? Yeah. So one thing I would say is I think we kind of have this image that there are like people that are good at STEM and people that aren't. And that's just really, really not true. Um, STEM's challenging for everyone at certain points and even if maybe like you struggled in math and your classmates have and that doesn't mean like in college that you maybe you would actually even be better at math like the, how the brain develops is kind of its own thing and that could change how your performance later but also it's just it is challenging it does take time to learn and understand math is its own language and you know it can be very challenging but it's also really really rewarding and just if you stick with it if you're patient with yourself you, you can achieve whatever you want and if your dream, dream is to be a rocket scientist you can do that and uh, there are many examples of people that maybe weren't at the top of their class that end up doing phenomenal things and i just would love it if you guys could keep that in mind Yes. So everyone is telling me I missed, I missed my calling. I could have, I could have done it. So I appreciate the enthusiasm for that. Um, so would you mind just letting me know what you would look for in a mission folder? What makes it stand out for you? Yeah. So, um, I, what a couple other cyber guides have said, you really want to see like that passion come through and that enthusiasm for the work and the process. And that can be multiple, be demonstrated in multiple different ways um yeah including extra pictures and making sure your graphs are really fully explained and a uh, color coded if your work lends itself to that a uh, video would be awesome and just really making sure your answers are clear and complete make sure you really provide a lot of detail we want to know all the steps you took and maybe you think like a step is really simple and you don't need to explain it it would be really helpful for us since we weren't there with you we didn't get to do the experiments or design or go through that engineering design process that you did so it's really helpful for us if you guys really go through um the steps really carefully and you include uh, pictures when you can. Thanks, Alexis. That was really good advice for our students. And I really appreciate you being here tonight and sharing some of those pearls of wisdom with everybody. Thank you. Really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. All right. So we are going to move on to our last cyber guide of the evening. Keaton, are you on? <clears throat> yes, I'm there. Hey. Um. All right. So if you would go ahead and just tell everyone kind of where you work and what you're doing at work right now. Yeah, I'm a product manager and taking after software applications in Gansys. And these applications uh, are across different sectors, which wide, very widely ranged from procurement through sales and distribution and finance. 
So what it helps is when, when we do the STEM applications, we actually learn how we can have these applications going across different sectors. And we are able to chime in and say that, hey, when you're doing a purchasing, there's an application which checks, okay, at what price have you purchased? What price are you gonna sell? What's the profit margin? And these applications are primarily helpful in getting through the students and then make them have a logical step into the next steps. So when you are doing the STEM um, in your school, the primary purpose should be to figure out how do we take it in a logical manner to take the next steps. It should be sequential in nature and it should make some sense that at the end you are trying to do a, a application which will have a practical view for all the steps which you're doing, right? If you can go to any of the grocery stores, you know, when they are bought all the store, all the products were there, there is a supply chain behind it. There is a procurement process behind it. These are all the steps which are going to help us drive it. So that's how we reach at this level. I would encourage all the students that go forward for it and give all, give all your energy to see how we can make a difference. See what is the right time to buy the product. See what's the math behind it. These are the things which we look forward from students. And from a judge perspective, I really want to see what are your efforts? How have you reached to that stage? Then as many of the uh, participants here have mentioned, we want to see them write it down and then we can help them go to that stage to applaud their work. Well, I appreciate it. you just answered like two or three of my upcoming questions. So thank you for giving, you know, those students tips on, you know, STEM and what you look for admission folders. I do want to ask you, how did you, how did you fall into this? What inspired you to get involved or what inspired you just in STEM in general? Um, it goes back to my childhood that uh, there's someone who has always been a mentor. And when I go through all these, what inspires is when we see this in practicality, we want the students also to take advantage of those situation. And we have gone through that pass. We have gone through that uh, many a times. And we just want to encourage them, take it forward. And there's no research which goes waste. It's just that how you try to reach those goals, you will go through paths which are really untraversed and it's going to take you to the next level. Thank you. I, I love how you always encourage students to just kind of keep pushing forward and, you know, be focused on STEM. And I just, I really appreciate what you bring to the table. So thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to stop sharing. And at this point, I am going to open up the floor to any questions about eCyber Mission or if you have any questions for our cyber guides. I know that sometimes you may not want to unmute and talk. So if you'd like to utilize the chat box, you're more than welcome to. And I am just going to give everyone a couple minutes to see if they have any questions. Um, I forgot. Wait, hold on. I gotta check what his name is, but it was the dude that does the lasers. I think it was Gregory. <laughs> yes, um, it was Dr. Garrett. <laughs> is it is there is it a possibility to make a laser strong enough to like cut through an object like in Star Wars? I love that question. Um, lasers are used a lot in um machining. Um I I know like when you go to stores for like paper and wood, it's really easy to find things that have been cut out by, by lasers. But uh, yeah, lasers are, are, can be very powerful. I know one of the things in my lab is people are, are studying diamond and diamond is really hard material. It's hard to cut diamond. So they're actually gonna buy a laser and use the laser to cut the diamond that they're trying to study. So I, I don't think you're gonna blow up the moon with the laser, but <laughs> I, I could cut your mom's diamond in half. That's pretty cool. I like that. Thank you for that question. I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, man, I wanted to become a guru and just laser it down. <laughs> <laughs> I got that reference, but they may not. So I, I love uh, Despicable Me. So thank you. <laughs> All right. Does anyone else have any other questions? Are there many scientists involved with the eCyber mission that can help advise students? All right, so this is, I love this question, so I'll go ahead and answer this. This is it. 
These are our cyber guides and you actually are going to have access to them through our message board. We already have a couple of posts. So that is access through your student, um, the student help center. You'll see a little message board button and you can go on there and ask any questions and it'll all alert our cyber guides if you have um, any questions. And let's see, you kind of corrected your question in animal biology. So again, the, we do have some scientists who are pretty well versed in biology. It really just depends on your question. You know, sometimes even people in various fields are so diverse that they could answer those questions too. So I recommend you using the message board. Does anyone else have any questions for our cyber guides? I'm going to ask this for my mom. It's kind of about the Zoom. Will we be able to watch the recording after? Yes. So I'm going to, okay. yes. So we'll post that recording on YouTube. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Give everyone just a couple more seconds in case someone's typing. All right. Well, with that, I want to thank all of our cyber guides for coming out tonight. I'm super excited to hear about all of your careers and, you know, I feel inspired. Oh, wait, we have one more question. I'll let this question go before we sign off for the night. So we have a question. Is there any type of lasers that can remove germs and can it be one type of germ, not all of them? I'm going to, I'm going to ask Dr. Garrett, but you know, Alexis or Ryan, if you have any input or, you know, if anyone has any additional input. Yeah. So actually that's one of the uh, reasons we're studying the uh, ultraviolet lasers is because um, ultraviolet light is good at uh, killing bacteria. Um, it's not very discriminative though. Uh, it will kill almost all the different types of bacteria. Um, maybe you've seen this in like a, a hiking store, an outdoor store where they put a little UV light on top of uh, your water bottle to help uh, purify it. Um, and besides, another important thing besides killing the germs is you can use the, use the lasers and do spectroscopy to identify what the the different um, germs are that are out there by looking at the uh, the different uh, missions or different uh, scattering that happens with the germs. Um, often it's, it's, it's important to know that there's germs out there and then you, you need to start wearing your masks or something. Thanks, Dr. Garrett. Did any of our other cyber guides have anything to add? Maybe with Dr. Tobias? Um, yeah, that's a good question, Christian. What I, maybe what I thought of is, um, yeah, like what what um, Dr. Gregory just said that you know um, something like uh, UV light in general is not usually like highly specific for only one type of germ versus all the other similar ones, but but maybe you know having a device, you know, what it say it's a mic with a microscope or a camera, and right, you know, like lasers can be a very small beam and be targeted. So maybe a whole device that, you know, identified the the bacteria with imaging and then kind of shot the laser at single cells, maybe that would accomplish what you're what you're envisioning there. But I think, yeah, like a laser or light light on a big field would would it may there may be certain types of microbes that would be more that would survive better, but it was not, that wouldn't be a very like targeted way of killing like only one kind. Thanks. Anybody else have anything to add? All right, well, that was a great question. Make sure we don't have any other questions sneaking in. All right. Well, I don't see anything else. So if anyone has a question that they didn't want to type or they think of later, please use that message board and all of our cyber guides will be able to answer that. So I want to thank everyone for coming out. I want to wish our students good luck. I want to thank our cyber guides and please remember to have those mission folders in by March 6th. So thank you guys and I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. You too. Bye. Bye. Good luck everyone.